Oh, or try, well, you try to measure it. Okay, we'll get started. Everyone, welcome to the second net summit of the quarter. Today we have Mohammed Alizade from Cisco Systems. Uh, he was working at a startup called Insieme Network before I got acquired at Cisco. He graduated uh, with his PhD at Stanford in 2013, has won several awards, including the SICOM 2014 Best Paper and the Num Numerical Technologies Prize and Fellowship. Also, his research projects have included architectures and algorithms for large-scale data centers, and his research on data center transfer has been incorporated in various operating systems like Windows and Linux, and also for Cisco's backend. So, without further ado, here's Mohammed. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it's great to, to be here. Uh, I am going to talk today about some work that we've done over the past uh, couple of years uh, on a new load balancing mechanism for data center fabrics. Uh, this is work with my uh, colleagues at Insiemi and uh, Cisco, and also uh, Terry Lam, who's at Google, and George Regis uh, at Microsoft Research. And uh, this is not a very long talk, so just uh, feel free to, to interrupt and uh, so we can make it interactive. Um, so to set the context uh, here, um, the motivation for this work is that uh, large-scale data centers need a lot of bisection bandwidth to support distributed uh, compute applications. Applications like um, big data analytics, high-performance computing, uh, large web services, they all need uh, a lot of network bandwidth uh, to support communication between lots of distributed components between, uh, across the servers in the data center. And so in response to this demand for uh, high bandwidth networks, uh, in the last several years, um, the industry has really moved on from the traditional single rooted tree topologies that were uh, very common in enterprise networks for uh, more than a decade to new multi-rooted uh, network designs. Uh, designs like the fat tree topology, or what I'm showing uh, here in this slide, which is a leaf spine fabric design. Uh, these uh, multi-rooted trees are really nice because they let you scale the bisection bandwidth of the network as much as you want by just adding more paths through the topology. So here, for instance, if I need more bandwidth, I can just go out a couple of times um, and I have a network with higher aggregate capacity. So this is great and uh, the industry is very much now deploying uh, networks like this. But if we take a step back and think about this, this is not exactly what we want. Uh, a multi-rooted tree is not really the ideal data center network. What is the ideal data center network? Well, the ideal data center network would really be sort of a big, uh, perfect switch, or sort of a, more precisely, a big output queue switch. So that's a switch where anytime you get a packet on an ingress port, uh, it would immediately, or after some fixed amount of latency, uh, land at its uh, eventual egress port, and then sit there at that egress port until it can get scheduled uh, and get sent to its uh, destination. Uh, why is this the ideal network? Well, note that it would not have any internal bottlenecks. Uh, the only constraints, the only bottlenecks on traffic in such a network are at the ingress and egress links, uh, so this network would give you uh, very good performance, or perhaps more importantly, very predictable performance. Um, and in fact, because of this predictability, this uh, type of network would give a very nice abstraction for higher level uh, bandwidth management and scheduling uh, tasks that we might want to do in a data center. Things like doing application-aware uh, bandwidth uh, uh, management and scheduling or uh, flow level, sort of sophisticated flow level schedule, become much easier if you can sort of ignore whatever is going on in the network and just assume that the bottlenecks uh, are going to be at the first stop and last stop. But the problem is we can't really build a network like this at any reasonable scale, so we're approximating it with these multi rooted network designs, which of course aren't ideal. They have these internal links which can become bottlenecks. And so this approximation is really only as good uh, to the extent that we can uh, balance traffic across all of these internal links and avoid uh, hot spots within the fabric. So, so we need precise load balancing. Well, it, I guess there's an implicit assumption that the bisection bandwidth is kind of different 
if you cut it at different places in this um, in this network on the right? Um, well, bisection bandwidth. Well, it's bisection bandwidth is defined across the it's the it's, it's defined across the entire network. Right? So it's the load balancing problem is is has even even with a sort of a symmetric network, you have to basically well, you have to load balance across all the paths to be able to actually use the bisection bandwidth of the network. I see. So, so it's not an oversubscription problem, but it's a load balancing problem. It's a load balancing problem, exactly. So yes, even if you have a full bisection data network, if if when making decisions, you happen to basically make, you know make put more traffic on some links than others, you're not going to be able to actually use your bisection data. Okay. Um, so how is this load balancing done today? Uh, well, today, um, pretty much the entire industry. As far as I know, uh, uses a simple scheme called UPOS multipath or ECP load balancing, and it's a very very basic idea. Basically, every switch uh, will compute a hash over the header fields of the packet, uh, precisely the five tuple: so uh, source IP, destination IP, source port, test port, and protocol. Um, and it, it would use this hash to pick uh, among the possible next hops for that packet. So I can have this flow here, and this switch will compute a hash, and it says go through spine number zero uh, for some other flow, and I compute another hash, and it says go through spine number two. Um, so this is basically doing, uh, you know, it's approximating uh, randomized load balancing, uh, and it's doing it at the connection level. Um, and the reason this is done at the connection level is because uh, some higher level protocols like TCP uh, they want all the packets of the same connection to be delivered in order, and, uh, and that's why this, uh, this, this is done in this way. Um, so, so that's a very simple. So there are two high-level problems with this. Uh, one is obvious, uh, is that you can have hash collisions. So I may have a flow that collides with previous flows, and uh, they get less capacity, less bandwidth, even though there are other paths available through the flow. The second problem, uh, which is somehow sort of more subtle and in some ways more fundamental, is that uh, this decision that ECMP makes is a purely local and stateless decision. It has nothing to do with what's actually going on in terms of congestion in the network. And so, so because of this, uh, these decisions can uh, end up being very poor decisions, uh, particular if the topology becomes asymmetric. Um, in, uh, or, or, the, or the traffic is highly asymmetric in, in any case, uh, due to, for example, link failures. So let me talk a little bit more about this asymmetry problem because I think it shows really this more fundamental problem with the CMP. Um, the challenge with asymmetry is that it, it fundamentally requires non-local, uh, handling asymmetry fundamentally requires non-local knowledge which the schema of ECT doesn't have. So just as an example of this, uh, so let's say you have a, a leaf spine network. Uh, I'm just going to draw this in a slightly different way. Uh, and I'm going to cut a link. So now we have an asymmetric leaf spine network. And consider sort of two sets of traffic demands. So this top leaf is going to have 30 gig of UDP traffic demand. Um, and this bottom leaf is going to have 40 gig of, of traffic demand. And this is going to be TCP traffic. Now this UDP TCP business is just for me to make this example simple to explain, and you'll see how, how that plays into this example, but it's not really fundamental to what I'm going to say. So the top uh, leaf doesn't really have any choice. It will just send its 30 gig of traffic demand on that single path that's available. The lower leaf has to make a load balancing decision across two paths. So let's look at three ways in which it might do this. Uh, so I'll start with ECMP, which is this local and stateless decision. So ECMP would split these connections uh, um, equally across the two patents. And uh, it wants to get something like 2020, but the traffic that's going to go on this top path is going to hit the UDP traffic and will have to slow down. So ECMP will end up getting 60 gig of aggregate through. Okay. Turning to a look, not a stateless scheme, sort of a congestion aware scheme, a stateful scheme, but that only looks at local information. So this is sort of a scheme. I mean, uh, imagine 
you, a, a switch will just measure congestion on the uh, on its immediate links and try to balance traffic uh, across them. And there are sort of uh, switches and, and there are a switching ASICs that can do uh, this, like the, I think the, the Trident chip from Broadcom, for example, does this for link aggregation, um, can do this for link aggregation. The problem is with um, this type of scheme across a sort of an end to end network, uh, it actually ironically can do exactly the opposite of what it should do. So here, this switch will look at these two links and say, look, it looks, it seems like the top link is less congested. So I'm going to move some traffic over to that top link. And it's only going to stop moving when it gets a balanced allocation. And because TCP is slowing down as you're moving traffic, you end up actually losing that. Link. You end up with <clears throat> so finally, if you had a global congestion screen, if you actually kind of had global awareness uh, of the network, you'd realize that the real problem is actually that link. And you'd move traffic away from that link. And in this case, you would be able to satisfy the 70 gig of traffic demand. So ECM, so global congestion rate is better than ECMP. That's not, I mean, that's, that's obvious. That's going to be expected. Perhaps a little bit more surprising is that you do need global awareness. If you just try to do something locally, um, you can actually even be worse than ECMP. And that's uh, that's more sort of a problem with how two control groups are interacting. I'm just trying to understand why would it balance? Why is the goal to balance the bandwidth for the local congestion? Uh, so the I think what people do, for example, for link aggregation, uh, is you're, you have links that you just they have the same capacity, and you're just trying to distribute traffic across them. And is the concern with you know hashing ECMP? So there are these schemes that do this in dynamic load balancing. Okay. They'll measure and they'll they'll balance, but it doesn't work. So the goal is to do like link aggregation, which would mean that you have the same bandwidth. Yes, that's right. So it sounds like the problem in the local case is that higher level protocols are throttling the rate at which they offer traffic to the lower level software because they're not getting responses back because some later link is saturated. And so the lower level software interprets this as the link being underutilized and if I can put more traffic on the link when yes. in fact it's going to hit the same bottleneck. Yes, I mean the, the fact that there was throughput loss here was this interaction between this local decision that's that's trying to balance uh, its own traffic and TCP throttling. So, uh, Upstream, but so but, you could improve that if you had some communication between the TCP protocol and the low-level balancer, so that you know that there's actually a problem downstream. So that would start. I think what you're going there is you're starting to get to uh, an implementation of a global congestion aware scheme where you, you split that. You, you might be able to split that functionality between a rate control algorithm, congestion control algorithm, and decisions in the network. So there is. I'll talk a little bit later about multi-path TCP, which is kind of doing something. But eventually, the, the main point is that you will need to somehow uh, consider uh, the state of congestion across the entire network the moment you have asymmetry. Um, so this global congestion awareness, uh, well, in, I mean, in general, it's, it's not an not a easy, easy problem. This, uh, a lot of the traffic engineering work uh, that, that has happened you know, in the kind of the wider network is exactly about this type of problem. And you know, generally it becomes sort of uh, fairly complicated. But it, I think there are sort of particular advantages in the data center environment that actually make this fairly easy uh, to handle, uh, at least in, in, in sort of practical uh, networks. So a couple of sort of observations about uh, data center fabric. So one is that the latency of a data center fabric is uh, very small. So between any two points in the network, you're always only a few microseconds away. And uh, you'll see that we can kind of leverage that to uh, pass information in the network very quickly. The other is that the topology is not some arbitrary uh, topology that you might see you know, in a wide area setting. It's a very simple, regular homogeneous topologies with maybe uh, some amount of asymmetry due to failures. Um, and because of this regularity, you'll see that, uh, as I'll show, sort of simple decisions actually tend to perform really well. You don't need very sophisticated uh, decision logic. So these are some of the opportunities. Destinations. Or is it, is uh, it, it's, it's really not about destinations. Time. It's probably scales over. according to scale. 
be routing the wireless. Mm -hmm. like well, this is the this is the uh, this is the overlay routing. So a thousand routes is really nothing. Like you, know, you would typically have hundred thousand you know tables that can do hundred thousand LPMs or more uh, in these switches. Um, but yeah, we don't anticipate a, a, you know a true network that spans more than a thousand leaf switches. It's, it's quite. It's quite okay. Let's thank Mohammed again. Changes about congestion, changes for congestion in So if you kind of look at uh, you know this this environment, um, a very uh, uh, that would actually handle this really well, and that's to use a distributed control mechanism, but make it extremely fast and extremely low latency, because a distributed control mechanism that runs in the data plane, uh, as you'll see, uh, it can naturally be very responsive. It, it can operate at the time scale of the network. Uh, and at the same time, with topologies, uh, it's very easy to actually design uh, these distributed mechanisms. Uh, the low latency makes feedback uh, latency not a problem. And uh, as, I, as I explained, so simple decisions, uh, simple greedy decisions tend to actually do really well. So that's the, the high level philosophy of common. And once you, uh, you kind of your mind on designing a distributed control mechanism for the slow bouncing problem, uh, Conroe's design actually becomes very straightforward. It's, it's, it's pretty much the, the easiest thing you, you might think of. Um, and so here's a, here it's kind of the high level of one slide. So all the leaf switches, um, you're going to track uh, congestion metrics uh, on different paths to uh, other leaf switches. And the key is that these per path congestion metrics are going to be tracked in near real time. And then they're going to use greedy uh, decisions to minimize the bottleneck uh, uh, that packets see through the network. So basically, we're only going to try to send traffic on the least congested <laughs> paths uh, at, at any. And in Conga, we do this by implementing these fast feedback loops directly in the data plane between all pairs of leaf switches. So this is a feedback mechanism that's implemented in the switching ASICs uh, in the pattern, pr predominantly in the leaf switches. And they have their own links to the uh, It all happens um, in that. I'll, I'll explain. Um, so so that's, that's kind of the high level design. And in the rest of the talk, I'm just going to kind of Explain now how it actually works and try to use it to So, Kanda um, operates over a standard uh, data center overlay uh, like VXLAN. And these overlays are already being deployed uh, in uh, data center networks. So, I don't want to spend too much time on the overlay, but the idea is that there are these standard tunneling mechanisms like VXLAN that are used to virtualize. Uh, the uh, data center network, and they provide an ideal uh, conduit for implementing a scheme like Conda. So basically, whenever a packet is sent to the fabric, that first leaf switch the packet and encapsulate it with uh, an overlay header, this VX9 header, this packet is now addressed to the destination leaf switch um, for that packet. Now you route the packet over the network. The destination leaf is going to again take the packet. It's going to remove the overlay header and send it onwards. <clears throat> That's kind of a very simple view of the overlay. How many top of rack switches should I assume exist in these data centers? Um, maybe a thousand is like very big. Okay. So typically, it's even be a couple hundred. And then, again, that even a couple hundred is a large network. So it depends on you know, if you look at like an enterprise network. You can, an enterprise, you might say 50. But yeah, I think a thousand. Um, so in Congo, we use this overlay uh, 
to implement that leaf to leaf feedback that I talked about. The idea is that every leaf switch uh, have a table. Uh, so when I say leaf switch, now I'm talking about that switching chip inside the switch. And there's a table in that switch, in that chip, uh, called the congestion to leaf table. And basically, it maintains for every other leaf switch in the fabric uh, a metric for each path. And it, the path is really for each that, it, that that packet could be sent on. And these metrics are, uh, in our implementation, they're just these three bit metrics um, that uh, represent the extent of congestion along the path. They basically are, uh, more, more precisely, they're the maximum link utilization along the path. So basically, at every switch, there is, uh, at every port in the fabric, there is this rate measurement module uh, sitting in the hardware that's measuring the link utilization on a very short time scale. I'm typically about a, in the time part, this in our implementation by default is 160 microseconds. And on a 160 microsecond time scale, it has this metric uh, from zero to seven that says how congested is that like. And I'm going to stitch those metrics along the path and take their max to get the path congestion metric. When we do this is when a packet is sent, that overlay header is now going to carry two extra pieces of information. One is a path ID, which the switch, the source switch sets to the uh, the uplink number uh, that it's going to send the packet on. And the other is this three-bit field. Um, I just call it congestion experience, kind of like what you see with ECM. Um, and uh, that's the path metric. So as the packet is sent, on every hop, uh, the switches overwrite this field if the link is more congested than what's in the packet. So by the time that the packet makes it to the destination, it carries the max congestion of the it experience along the path. So this is the information that we want. You know, path to the metric was five, but we need this at the source. Um, so we need to feed it back, and the way we do this in Conga is temporarily we're going to store this metric uh, in table at the destination leaf. And then whenever we see any packet going in the reverse direction, it's going to pick it up from the destination and bring it back to the source. So it takes the next step from there and brings it here. Uh, and that's how we get the metric to get, uh, at, at the source leaf. And how now, do you, for, a, for a given packet, how do you choose whether you put the actual the, the tracing from this or the feedback? Yeah, so, we, so yeah, that's. More of the way I explained it, every packet actually carries both. So every packet carries a metric for its forward <coughs> path as well as <coughs> feedback from its source to its destination. Seems like your path's only unique if you have a two level network. If you have a third layer in the network, then, uh, then there's multi path into the next layer also. And so the, the, yeah. the port out of the leaf switch is not a unique identifier. Yes. Yeah, so there's a, so even in a two level network, and I have a, I have a slide on this, but even in a two level network, is that two paths yeah. or one path? Um, so, and you'll see it's actually worse than this. There's potentially multipathing happening inside that switch as well. That could be a modular switch. Um, so we're actually aggregating in reality. We're aggregating paths at the level of the first hop. But the idea is that these two links are, if you're balancing you know, at the level of flow lets, which I'll describe in a second, across them, these two links are pretty, pretty similar. So you don't see a lot of asymmetry here the way you might see, for example, between this path and that path. But there's an aggregation happening. Meaning that the utilization is sort of an aggregate utilization of those two links, for example? Um, the, no, uh, no, every link is doing this independently. Um, but this switch is spreading traffic uh, across these two links. Uh, so every packet, when it goes here, see the congestion that that link had. Um, but that, in, if this switch is doing its job well, that should be about half of what's actually going on those links. If that switch is imbalanced, if, if this balancing is, is not happening well, uh, a lot of congestion. So you're time averaging the statistics that are coming back then in order to, to average out so, those effects? So let me get to the path aggregation, then I'll, I'll get back to exactly this one. But uh, that, we actually don't need to do that, it turns out. <laughs> yes. Uh, so is this all being managed entirely in the ASIC, or is there mm -hmm. CPU intervention to manage? No, it's ASIC? entirely in the ASIC. Okay. Yeah. You don't, you don't touch, touch CPU. 
Um, the other thing that I, I guess was clear um, that this reverse traffic and the forward traffic have nothing to do with each other. They don't have to be from the same connection, same flow, any packet that's going uh, under restriction can cut it. We don't really need that many packets to carry this feedback, even with a very simple scheme. So for instance, in our implementation, you might have 12 uplinks. So there's 12 metrics to convey, and any 12 packets that go back can convey that. It will not work well if you just have a unidirectional flow. Like if you have no traffic in the reverse direction, with this piggybacking implementation, you have a problem. Um, so we chose to basically keep the ASIC implementation with piggybacking, not generate a packet from, from the ASIC. Yeah. But uh, yes, there is. We are making the assumption that there are going to be a few packets in the reverse direction, that there's a lot of traffic in the forward direction. Um, that's right. Sorry, I think I missed something. So when you're sending the response back, the that L2 switch actually has several different values coming from L0 via different paths. Which one is it sent back? Just the one for the path that it's sending? Um, no, so there's a, there's an algorithm here that's described in the paper that it, it basically tries to, um, like the strawman version of it is that you're just going, there's a pointer and just going round robin and trying to pass the next um, metric that you have on, on a packet that's going in the reverse direction. Um, as an optimization, we actually uh, keep track of which metrics have changed since the last time that they were fed back and prioritize those first. Um, but on every packet that's going back, the switch will uh, look at the destination of the packet in this table. So the destination of the packet for these guys would be L0. And then it has an algorithm for picking among the metrics. Um, so that's how we end up uh, populating this table. Uh, what do we do with these is uh, we do the, the simplest thing that you would think of. We always try to send on the most ingested path. Um, so every time we have a decision to make, um, we look across a row of this table and pick the, uh, the paths that have the smallest metric. Um, and we break ties at random. And that's the, that's the basic uh, decision logic is that we can't really do this today on a packet by packet basis. Uh, we, because uh, that would uh, potentially cause out of order packets that would confuse TCP. Um, so we do this on a this idea from about 10 years ago that um, if you look at two bursts within the same TCP flow, um, if the gap between the two bursts is bigger than the latency difference. Uh, between the two paths that you're going to actually make a decision for, you can send one verse on one path, another verse on another path, and you're guaranteed not to cause a hardware again. Um, so in Congo, we actually do this. The hardware detects flow maps by looking for gaps, and when it sees a gap, it says, okay, now I can make a load balance decision, and that's when you actually go and look at these metrics. <clears throat> I need to jump back to sleep, but uh, the gate in states, is the reason for having such a small number of hardware limitations doing all the comparisons that you have to do all the time. Like you can't have more states and you don't need more states. Um, it probably fits in the fits in the packet. It's, right? it's, it's, in the packet. The, that's, it's actually kind of silly and but the most uh, um, precious resource yeah, the time, and all of this is actually the header space. Um, so these tables, I mean the like a lot of us on give you some numbers, it's like about maybe a little bit less than 2% of the die area of, of the ASIC is for these tables. Um, but we have to fight for every bit in that header because there's a lot of things that you want to do. Yeah. Um, I don't guess you would benefit from many more bits anyhow. I don't want to get by with fewer bits. It's two bits. Yeah, yes, but bit. so we, we did kind of uh, look at this in, in a lot of simulations. I would have wanted four. <laughs> But I couldn't get four. But yes, that's right. You, 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 you. So, so who made the decision that you couldn't, that you couldn't get four? Uh, I mean, which is that, you know, did you decide sort of a priori that, oh, this has to be, you know, I can only use the bits in, in a 24 bit or whatever it is field, yeah. you know, or, sort of who made that decision and why, I guess, or it doesn't matter. It's, it's a big fight among all the different features that you might want to uh, implement over this, this, this fabric. Uh, there's a lot of arguments. <laughs> yeah, presumably that, that also, you know, the number of bits you have also probably depends on the number of switches you have. For the metric, no. 
for um, like in this algorithm, the, the packet has to carry a path ID, and that does depend on how many paths you want to actually uh, you know, track. Exactly, and if you, I think you, you seem to indicate you, that, you, that you were looking at sort of the n squared, where n is the number of switches, right? That all, all, all. No, no. Right so those, uh, so the identity of the, the the other leaf, that's in the. You already need that because you need to route. There's an IP address um, that says where this leaf is, and you you need to route to that address. So you have that um, to begin with. Um, the extra state that you need for this is these congestion metrics uh, that you're signaling. So if you think about like, what are we gaining by the overlay? So why did I say that this needs an overlay? Uh, we're really gaining two things. One is this header space uh, to actually do the simulation. The other is, in normal routing, you would not know the ultimate destination at the source. So every switch would only know the next hop. And then you couldn't actually need sort of a tunnel to the destination to, to make this type of design possible. So if, uh, do you assume here that the hypervisor does not use the VHLAN headers and it's all yours? Uh, um, no. Uh, now this starts becoming very specific to you know, this implementation that we had um, in this fabric. Uh, you can have a, an encapsulated packet come in. Mm -hmm. uh, the switch will um, basically... Stack another. The no, is transparent from, from the edge. So it does a translation and translates back on the other side. Yes. So imagine between L1 and non internal modulator headers for your packing. It's it's the path. The path and yeah, it, it's it's large it, it's 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 information that is not going to be visible outside, but yeah. but it is the it's a it's still a standard DX9 header. But we're we're not I, mean, I think what you're uh, kind of not thinking about is um, if you have a modular switch, um, you may have some internal header that you, uh, like a high gig header that you have to packets between the line cards and the power So this is not kind of like that. If you actually like look at, if you sniff on the wire here, you'd see a standard VX9 header. But we're just, uh, VX9 header has a bunch of reserved bits that haven't been defined. We're just taking some of them and using those. Is that using a slapping in the header and removing the header back to building it? There is a, an overhead for for having that header, but that's already again there, you know, with with an overlay on a VX line. Um, uh, does it send information between L0 and L0 or does it change the path in which the packet will travel? No, so yeah, the the, the metric carries um, uh, the, the the packet carries two metrics. One is for the path that it is traversing. Um, so that's why you had a path. Like Four sets, and uh, you have the metric that gets updated along in, in the network. There's a feedback metric as well, which is completely orthogonal to what's happening to this line. It's some information that you're carrying from uh, one switch to another, but all past some of this, it's like one forward metric, one reverse metric. The path, the path ID is a local scope to the switch. The path ID is a local scope to the switch. It's really local scope to the source leaf. I can just ask like under a question like why is it so important that you deliver the packets in order? I mean, are... um, don't ask. Don't. <laughs> We're trying to fix that actually. <laughs> um, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And we actually there's some research that uh, I'm doing with a student here um, on exactly uh, what it would take to do reorder resilience for stack for data centers. But um, today, uh, if you don't deliver packets in order. Uh, TCP will uh, look at out of order packets as a sign of uh, packet loss in the network. And it will start to invoke its congestion control necessarily when it sees out of order packets. So I talked about this. Uh, ah, so the path aggregation, we already talked about it. That when I say path here, I really mean the first hop. Um, it's uh, tagged based on the first hop. Uh, so that whole thing is two paths. This is one path in, in this definition. Um, and like I said, it's actually worse. Inside that spawn, you might have a whole bunch of things. Um, and this is just for scalability reasons. So um, in that case, uh, it's a 
architecture. We live with scope it, like the, the bottom layer tracks its path ID and up up layer tracks um, its path ID. That doesn't uh, exactly work. So so just to be clear for one thing, so this design was um, you know, our our goal was to network. I mean that that was kind of this product um, in. Uh, in the context of a, a multi-tier architecture, this right now would be suboptimal. This is the most, I mean, if you have a lot of aggregation, you're at some point you don't get you don't get you know, enough information. The problem with trying to uh, stitch together, uh, so like have one path ID that's let's say about this tier, another path ID that's about this tier, is you still need communication between the tiers. So it could very well be that this this switch needs to actually know that somewhere out there there's a problem. So even if you have uh, other decisions of different tiers, you still will need to feed back something to this switch. So it makes connect as an aggregate, right? Mm -hmm. Just like you have the aggregate for the two links, you have the aggregate for both. Yes. Potentially. So, so, there, there, again, so there, there may be ways of doing this, but it seems at some point if you're uh, looking at it, uh, you might actually uh, there are other ways of trying to do this this type of design there, of, of doing kind of utilization of the routing where you might look at it as um, every switch um, basically makes hop by hop makes its own decisions. We, we then have hop by hop decisions, and there are algorithms in the literature for these things, but significantly more complicated than this. So for this we we do this. What do you mean by aggregate? You just take the latest result from any So when we started this, um, and actually it is. Actually, it is in the hardware. Uh, this uh, switch can actually average and feed data. But when we actually started experimenting with this and, and similar this, we said you don't really need to do this. So the, um, what, you, what you're feeding back is always the latest. And that latest um, may not be 100% uh, accurate. But in the most common case of congestion, it actually is. So it turns out to be pretty effective. Uh, so what I mean by that is, if you have a large flow, if you have a sort of a large flow that you, you want to move, um, the metric, that path metric, will tend to bias toward the traffic of that large flow anyway. Does that mean? So imagine you're always taking the latest. If you're always taking the latest, the metric that you're going to get is going to be for where the where most of the traffic is coming. If, if traffic is coming equally at any point in time, you're, you're equally as lucky to get the metric for any. So overestimate that. You, you yes exactly. But, I, I, but well, I don't know if it's I'd say overestimation. It's what I'm saying is if you take the last metric and you look across a bunch of samples, it's the same as looking at the average, because on every single packet. The metric says, here's how much congestion it actually experienced through the pattern, whichever one of these different paths it took at that point. And if you feed back any of those and make a decision, that decision is not, that decision is, is, is across multiple samples. It's just like making a decision across an average. So we actually found that it's better not to average and just make decisions on the last sample. And uh, it, does actually that actually turns out to perform better than averaging, because I think the reason is because it gives you sort of micro optimize micro opportunities to optimize. Um, if if you see a burst, you will very quickly uh, it will bias that metric and you'll actually you get get it. Whereas if you do an averaging here, you slow down that reaction. We need to go touch all the switches and then the switch to establish the path. Uh, when a switch, let's say that we're creating yeah. Ln, yeah. we need to go and fix Lo to Ln minus one to establish a path during uh, provisioning. Yeah, time. you you do need to um, in this table, you do need um, you do need an identifier for a destination to be able to look up something in this table. But that's no different than how you do routing. So you already basically need to do that. What I mean is maintaining the overlay as part of this mechanism. There's an overlay and there's a routing mechanism 
already with associated with that overlay. And we just we just build on top of that. Because you need that anyway, because when you get a packet, if a new switch has come up and it has some destinations under it, the others need to know that uh, a particular destination or either VM is under this new switch. So they need to know about that new switch anyway. And again, how that is done, there's a lot of ways of doing that. It could be kind of a you know, a centralized uh, location service uh, doing that. In this fabric, there's another way of doing that in the data plane as well, which goes kind of beyond that. So do you get stuck at any point? They say link goes down and then it comes up, and because you have no history about it, and you try, and you don't have the, random, the randomness of PCMP, you want some traffic there. Comes up. Uh, I see. So there's. There's again something that I haven't really talked about. It is in the paper that you do need to age these metrics. So both on this table and that table, if they if you're not actually updating a metric over time, you need to assume that uh, it. And that's what makes you. That's what makes sure that you will probe a path that you decided at some point was unavailable or congested. So because of that, then. What is what do the three bits measure? Is it measure the utilization of the link? They measure, so there's a three bit metric for every link, and the utilization. Yeah, yeah. So we have a three bit metric. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, I, so I want to spend just a minute on this, I think this is important. So if you if you ever worked on these um, back mechanisms, you might be thinking at this point is that why would such a sort of simple, greedy, Decision actually result in a stable control. So there's usually a lot more you have to do to, um, to stabilize these control loops. And uh, the essence of the problem is: so imagine you have a source leak and a destination leak with paths, and you start in a state like this. If this guy uh, reacts uh, and moves traffic too quickly, you could overshoot its target. And by the time that it realizes this, it's too late. So then it has to adjust back, and you have kind of oscillations happening in, in, in the decisions. This controller might be reacting faster uh, than it can actually observe the impact of its decisions. So there's a sort of a, a, a trade-off. There's a there's a there's an interplay between the, how fast you move traffic and how fast can you observe the state of the network. Um, in Conga, uh, we kind of get away with a very simple rule because the feedback latency is very small. Uh, so typically, if there's a lot of traffic, we're going to get feedback within microseconds. Um, and this reaction, it's dampened by uh, the fact that you have to wait for a full and opportunity. Um, so if you're making packet by packet decisions, I think you have to be more careful. Um, so the combination of this dampening that full lights gives you uh, in the reaction speed and feedback latency is what happens. So applications also are going to be running control loops at microsecond level for certain grids. So you assume that. You mean, you mean higher level of TCP? Uh, I mean, I guess maybe. Yeah, that's right. But yes, that's that's an important point. That is the null interaction. You they, they do yeah. There's a there's a time scale separation, and so you want this to be very fast, so that it looks transparent from from a higher level. I think that's not obvious that you can do it. But. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I'm gonna skip this. What are you seeing with respect to improvement opportunities in different type of bandwidth? Like, mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, we did um, we did sort of a there's a measurement uh, in, in the paper that we, we we took kind of a packet trace and we looked for uh, for different values of flow length gap. Uh, what are the size of the flow length gaps? Uh, the flow length. What are the flow length sizes? Uh, you typically, I think, get sort of a median of tens of packets, um, but it can be large sometimes. So the, the downside of that, an ideal mechanism, the downside is it's not entirely predictable. So if you have a high rate flow, uh, it may never let up, and you won't get an opportunity. Um, but the other side of the argument is if you have a high rate flow, it must be doing well. Um, so you may not need to move it also. Um, so it's, it's a, so I think kind of uh, the short answer is, is tens to hundreds of packets, you can say, um, but uh, it's it's not entirely predictable. 
Oh, for the flow lets. Yeah. So the flow lets are actually, uh, it's kind of a best effort uh, type of implementation. You um, you have a, a large uh, array of buckets, so 64K of buckets. Um, you hash into a bucket, and you have a, sort of a, an age bit on every bucket. Uh, so if you if you see a hit in a bucket, uh, you say that bucket is active. It is active. And there's a timer that goes around and keeps resetting the buckets. So we're not actually doing precise measurements. It's you may have multiple flows that hash the same bucket. And then you would treat it as if they're the flow that's of the flow that is bigger. Because we're, 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 we're kind of making a soft decision based on this you know, to begin with. It's not it's not entirely, it's a statistical decision you know, to begin with, so you don't need to be super precise. Uh, if, you have a, if you have fewer buckets, you won't, you won't have as many flow of opportunities. Just one, one cache to be open. It's just one, one cache with 64K, but that's actually pretty big if you think about it, because when these buckets get um, aged out a uh, few hundred microseconds. So it's not sort of at the time scale of, of, of the life of a connection, is, do I see a packet? How many packets do I see? How many different flows do I see within a few hundred microseconds? And what we found is uh, you typically see far, far fewer than you know, 64K. Uh, it might be like a few thousand. And what is the data that we come from? What is the improvement rate? Yeah. So, all, all that. so um, uh, the so this this is this has been implemented. So that's Conga on the chip that we, that we implemented, and it's about two percent of the die area. Um, can we just sort of talk about some highlights? There's a lot more um, in the paper that we, we wrote about this. Um, this is um, for a synthetic workload uh, that is based on uh, empirical um, traffic measurements. So this is a workload where you have sort of random arrivals of flows. And the size of every flow is taken from a distribution um, uh, that's based on sort of prior measurements in, 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 uh, in papers from data centers. So this particular one, I think, is based on the BL2 paper from Microsoft. Um, and we're running at different levels of load and measuring the completion time uh, for the flow. So this is completion time at, in the application. And, and the, the flows are, some of them are large, some of them are small. So kind of separated them out in elephant flows and mice flows. So this is all the flows that are bigger than 10 megabytes in the sense of the bandwidth that they can achieve. And you see that, uh, so this, everything is normalized to ECMP. So you see sort of both Conga and multipath TCP uh, get an improvement, which is up to 35% uh, at higher levels of load. Um, so multipath TCP is a transport level solution to this problem. Uh, you make the TCP layer aware of the paths, and it tries to balance across sort of sub connections for the different paths. It's, so, it's really kind of similar because the TCP also sort of has that same feedback loop. That's right. The only thing is the feedback is at a per connection level, whereas here the feedback is, a, is, at, a, is at a much sort of uh, it's across flows. Yeah. Um, so this for well, large flows, they actually perform quite similarly. Um, for small flows. See that, uh, so the implementation of the is Oh, no, so I think the bigger thing with MPTCP, uh, at least the current implementations of MPTCP, is that it has an issue for small flows. Um, so the problem is that uh, MPTCP will take a small flow and it will spread it across multiple connections. So the amount of data on each connection becomes very small, and with TCP, with small amounts of data <coughs> on a connection, um, you become able to time out some retransmission problems when you get packet drops. So you can see for small flows, there's a performance degradation because of this. Um, the biggest benefits, though, like I said, come when you have uh, an asymmetry in the topology. So this is uh, uh, now an, an HDFS benchmark where we're writing one terabyte into HDFS and uh, measuring how long that MapReduce job takes. And there's a link. Uh, that's down, so you have an asymmetric topology. So just to give you a 
without the failure, you get 220 seconds. That's how long the job takes. Um, with ECMP, uh, there's a 2x increase due to that link failure. But with Conga, uh, you almost don't see uh, that link failure because you're now able to adjust to the fact that the torsion is asymmetric. And MPTCP has uh, some performance variability, which we weren't able to precisely pin down. We think this is because of um, the same kind of problems that I showed for small and kind of in cast periods, but we're not entirely sure why MPTCP has so much variability. Just understanding MPTCP in this case, you're running at the application, like, like running on a CPU, not running on a hardware. MPTCP is just a, uh, it's drop in for TCP. Yeah, so exactly. it's running so, in the operating system. So given that, I mean, you're reacting on the scale of microseconds, and they're reacting at best. Yeah, but why would it be worse than TCT with TCP? Yeah, I guess that's right. So I think, uh, yeah, I think, uh, so we looked at sort of some in-cast settings as well, some, some more controlled benchmarks. And every city has an issue uh, during these in-cast problems. We think that's the reason for this. Um, but I think that sort of the larger point that I want to make, so just one the larger point that I want to make is not that you can't solve this, these problems in every city. I mean, uh, you can potentially do this at the transport level as well. Um, but this is more to say that transport is already pretty complex in data centers. You have you know, multiple requirements, the throughput, the latency, the tolerating bursts, uh, and they're all intertwined. And making, sort of adding load balancing just adds another dimension. Um, whereas architecturally, um, what we're arguing really is to decouple these two. This is an interesting, I guess, thing that, that this Point that this raises, which is that you know MPTCP is sort of deployed and is trying to do a similar thing, a similar load balancing thing at the, at the transport layer. And the question is, how do they interact if you deploy both of them? Are they compatible or do they fight each other? Um, MPTCP, we did actually try it with Kong that works pretty similarly to what you would see with ECMP. Uh, but I think so. I don't think. I mean, one point I'm trying to I think the deployment sort of environment for MPTCP, I think, is, should be different than what this does. So if you're trying to do multi-path load balancing across a wider unit, uh, right, if you're trying to go through like a Wi-Fi and a cellular yeah, network, exactly. that's a very different problem than this very controlled problem of uh, you have kind of this regular topology where you're doing uh, balance balancing across it. And so I think architecturally, it makes sense to a network, a data should present this abstraction. The transport layer uh, needs to still solve the problem of contention at these edges. And that's that's the architecture that we're advocating for this. Uh, so just to summarize, I talked about Conga. Uh, and this has been implemented in the Cisco ACI fabric. Um, and I think the conceptual takeaways really here are uh, one that uh, I could just argue in network load balancing is a good fit for data centers. And when you're thinking about these feedback control mechanisms, uh, there's no latency that gives you uh, actually simplifies uh, the design a lot. And uh, I'll stop. Thank you. Do we have logic uh, to separate uh, the Uh, to separate elephant flows from the others, um, in, in terms of like QoS or, or routing? Or whatever, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so for, not, not in the specifically. So the Conga is breaking up elephant flows into these flowlets as well. So we're trying to make everything look like a kind of a small flow that you can make a decision on. But we're not specifically measuring that this is an elephant flow and that's an elephant flow. Now we're just looking for these gaps, and every gap that we see gives us an opportunity to make a new world balance decision. So I really like the Conga, sorry, the uh, Hadoop test that you had. It's like an end-to-end, -end, like hundred second test. Mm -hmm. Is there like a way to calculate the optimal offline fastest? You, like, let's say you knew totally a priori what the yeah. flows are going to be. What is the fastest you can do that job? Um, I, I know, I, I, I love that question. I think it's. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, is that it depends on, it's not just the network, it kind of depends on how these blocks are distributed across um, like servers, um, how much can leverage locality. I do think 
these, these big data systems from a performance perspective there's kind of a black box view to them uh, and there aren't very good there isn't very good understanding of balance on performance and you could run a key view if you yeah so if you knew exactly if you knew demand. exactly the traffic demand that you're going to get so you knew exactly where the blocks were so sure from a network perspective you can figure out what is the next span of that of that communication matter but you know if you tell me well, I have the main span the main span is kind of the last well actually that's the scheduling term but um yeah but if you tell me like I have you know write in Hadoop how long should it take it's very hard to say I think last question after the two percent price does that include the program processor Yes, the full net processor. The, I mean, the, the full net table is actually very, very small. So even though it's 64k entries, each entry is only I think uh, 11 bits in that implementation, um, and it doesn't even need to be like this. There's some other stuff that we're doing. Uh, so it's very small. Uh, the bigger thing here is that table of congestion metrics. So you have a, you know a thousand destinations, 12 paths. Um, and three bits per path, and and that that's what really adds up. That's the biggest cost. <clears throat> Presumably, that limits the size of your network, the number of destinations you can reach. The number of destinations, or is it, is uh, it, it's it's really number of destinations it's times it's probably scales of, according to scale commensurate to your routing table. Like that. Well, this is the this is the uh, this is the overlay routing. So a thousand routes is really nothing. Like. We have 100,000 know, tables that can do 100,000 LPMs or more uh, in these switches. Um, it, but yeah, we don't anticipate a two tier network that spans more than 1,000 leaf switches. It's, it's quite. Let's thank Mohammed again.